The issue of temporal and spatial aliasing is incredibly important because if we do not get an accurate rendering, recording of our world, we are going to have trouble downstream in trying to build systems to reason about that world. However, we don't often have a lot of control of our recording device. We stick a camera out in the world and we may not have control over the sampling rate. We may not have control over the spatial frequency makeup of the world. It may be a high frequency. I may have decided to wear a striped shirt or a high frequency shirt, pattern shirt, and we don't have control over that. But one thing we do have control over is once we have that sampled image, and as long as we're aware of the fact that aliasing may happen, we can be on the lookout for it. But once we have that, we also have to think about what happens as we manipulate the image ourselves. Because when we go from continuous to discrete, we've seen that there's a sampling process and it can be done with high fidelity or it can introduce uh, aliasing depending on the Nyquist limit. But the same thing is going to hold when we start with a high resolution image and maybe we downsize that image because it's computationally efficient. That same concept of spatial aliasing is going to emerge and that is something that we can control and we have to control. All right, so let me remind you where we were. We're going to start again with a continuous signal over here um, and f of x over here. So that's my continuous signal. I have my uh, 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 sampling train. So this is a bunch of deltas separated by t. That's my sampling density. I can control that, of course, um, depending on, on uh, which camera I use, a high resolution camera, a low resolution camera. Um, that's, of course, just made up of a bunch of delta functions, which you see over here. Now, I'm going to multiply that impulse train with my signal to give me a continuous but sampled signal. So all I've done here now is I've zeroed out all of the values that are not at integer multiples of the sampling uh, value of t. And then finally, I do a continuous to discrete sampling where I actually grab only every teeth element in the signal. So that's the recording process. Okay, so now what I have is my f of x square bracket, discreetly sampled signal or image. Now, as I said earlier, sometimes I want to downsample. Maybe I don't want to analyze a 10 megapixel image because computation is too demanding. So maybe I want to go down by half resolution or quarter resolution. How do I do that? Well, I sample. So for example, I might take this signal right here um, that is at every that has been sampled at every t value, and maybe I want to sample it so it's every 2t. So I want half the resolution. Well, can I just throw away every sample and everything is fine? I mean, that doesn't ring true, does it? Because when you throw away information, it doesn't seem like it's going to be completely innocuous. And in the same way, we are throwing away some information when we go from here to here. We are throwing information when we go from here to here, and we need to think about it. And it's going to turn out that that same concept of aliasing and Nyquist holds in this domain as well. So let me just, by way of intuition, show you what this might look like. So imagine I have um, f of x here, and here's my sampling uh, lattice here. And I'm gonna, so this is my f of x, and you can see here what I've done is I'm gonna reduce the sampling rate by a factor of two. So this is just some signal that goes from positive to negative and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab the first element from here in f and put it into g. And then I'm gonna skip one in F and put that into the next element of G and skip one next and next. So I'm sampling every other sample. Again, why would I wanna do that? Uh, computational efficiency is usually, I, I don't wanna store a big signal. I don't wanna do computation on a big signal. So I'm gonna subsample with the hopes that I can do computations very fast here. And in this case, you know, it looks about right. I mean, basically the pattern of the signal looks about right. It doesn't look like I've lost a lot of information, although honestly, I don't really know. I'm just assuming that that's the case because it basically looks right. But let's think about a different type of signal. Let's think about this signal up here, which granted is a little bit contrived, but I think it's going to illustrate the point. It goes from a value of one to negative one, one to negative one. And by the way, what's the difference between this signal and the previous signal? This one is very high frequency. It's changing very rapidly over time. Um, and the other one was not. It was changing relatively slowly over time. So I grab this, the first value over here and I put it into my sampled signal here. I skip one and I grab the next one. I skip one and I grab the next one. I skip one and I grab the next one. And what's happening doesn't look very pretty. 
this signal subsampled by a factor of two now looks like a completely different signal, right? Instead of having this very high frequency, one minus one, one minus one, one minus one, it looks like a flat signal of all ones. And again, this is completely contrived, but it's not, um, it is something that happens um, regularly with signals and images that when you sample from one sampling rate to a lower sampling rate, you're throwing away information. And if you are not respecting the sampling uh, theory of Nyquist, you're going to have trouble because you're throwing away information. Now, there are two things we saw with continuous to discrete that you can control to get within Nyquist limit. One is you can have a band limited signal. So just don't have high frequency. Yeah? So now the world is the world, so I can't maybe do a lot about that. So the other thing I can do is control the sampling rate. Sample at a higher rate. So let's say you, on your camera, you can record either at VGA or HD, HD quality. If you're worried about aliasing, go all the way up to HD and you're, gonna, you're less likely to get an alias signal. Now in discrete to discrete, um, you also have the same problem. We just saw it. If you have something that's changing relatively slowly, maybe you can downsample with other problems. But if you want to downsample, say, by a factor of two, you don't have a lot of control over anything at this point. The signal is what the signal is. It's got whatever frequency makeup it has. And you want to downsample by two because you don't want to deal with the runtime complexity of analyzing the full signal or image. And now you've got to make some decisions. Do you want to just sample and take your chances that you're not going to get aliasing artifacts and destroy your signal and then be analyzing something that has nothing to do with reality? Well, that doesn't seem like a good bet to take. And so the standard thing to do is to say, look, here's the sampling rate I want to get to. And now what I'm going to make sure is that my signal going into that sampling is band limited. That is, I don't have these high frequencies. I'm going to throw away some high frequency information so that when I sample, I don't get this nasty aliasing artifact. And now it seems like we've done a deal with the devil, right? On the one hand, we said, well, just sample your signal and hope for the best you get aliasing artifacts. And the other is, well, modify your signal to remove high frequencies and then sample, but I've also now modified my signal. Um, so which one is better? I would argue that the latter is better for the following reason. You know what you're doing. You know what you're getting when you remove high frequencies and work at a lower resolution. With aliasing, it's highly, highly unpredictable what's going to happen. And so the cost of working at the lower resolution is you simply can't represent high frequency information. That should go without saying. If I sample at half the rate, I can't represent a fast change, um, changing signal. Own that, say fine, I'm gonna throw away all those frequencies and I'm simply going to work it with this lower uh, frequency signal, try to infer what I can from them, but at least I'm not introducing false information into the signal and I would argue that that is the better bargain. So how do you do that? Well, the standard way to do it is to blur your image. So what does blurring do? It removes those really rapid oscillations. And so here's the game we're gonna play. We're going to take our signal f of x right here. Um, this is the sampling um, uh, lattice here. And, but before we sample, we're going to convolve, there's the star operator right there, with some low pass filter, some averaging filter. The standard thing to do is a Gaussian, e to the minus x squared over sigma squared, where of course sigma controls the width of this Gaussian or normal distribution, and it looks something like that. So what is this going to do? It's going, we're going to convolve with this. So remember what that means. We take this little guy right here and we slide it across the signal or across the image, um, computing inner products between. So we, we sum, we multiply, and we sum. And so that's just computing a little weighted average. And it's a nice, soft, gentle uh, fall off, which is why we like it. Now, in the Fourier domain, what does that convolution look like? Because what I said is that that little blurring is going to remove high frequencies, and we should understand why that is. Okay? So let's see here. This right here is f of omega. That's my Fourier magnitude of my original signal with some high frequencies. I am going to convolve that in the space domain with my Gaussian, which is what in the Fourier domain? The multiplication with the Fourier transform of the Gaussian. There are many, many reasons to love the Gaussian. Here's another one. The Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. And that's what I'm representing right here with h of omega. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply that thing by that thing right there. And notice that my Gaussian in the Fourier domain, h of omega, is narrower than the Fourier energy of my signal. And that's exactly what I want, because when I multiply these two together now, 
I'm going to get this narrower version. Why is that good? Well, the narrow version means I don't have high frequencies anymore, and that means I can sample this thing and not get aliasing artifacts. Okay? So here again, you can see this power of, some, of moving between the space domain and the Fourier domain. You can see the power of this relationship of multiplication and convolution between space and Fourier because we can reason about the signals in different domains. And so by simply convolving in the space domain by Gaussian, multiplying by in the, in the Fourier domain, I will have a band limited signal, which I now can subsample without fear of aliasing. And you can see this manifest itself, and this, you've almost certainly seen this um, if you've taken images with particularly high frequency patterns. So this is a high resolution image of a brick wall, very high frequencies because the, the texture is changing very rapidly on the brick wall. Up in the top over there is where I have low pass filtered with a Gaussian and then subsampled the image to the, to the resolution that you see over there. And then I'm showing you a magnified view of that beyond. And you can more or less see the pattern of the brick. It's, we've lost a little bit of detail. Below what I've done is I didn't blur before I subsampled. I just kept throwing away every other pixel, every other pixel, um, until I got the resolution shown here. And now when you look at that, you see something very different than up top. You see lots of high frequencies, right? This actually you know, looks sort of sharper in some ways, but notice the pattern is bizarre. It's not a brick pattern. It's got like some weird pattern on it with these diagonal features, which is the quintessential sign of spatial aliasing. And so it looks like this one might be better because you have all this high frequency pattern, but it's artificial. You're making up information. And if you're going to work at this resolution down here, you should be true to what that resolution can represent, which is relatively low frequencies. And we are simply enforcing that by blurring the image before downsampling. So in some ways, this whole bit of the lecture was down to this one idea, but it's a really important one, which is why it was worth doing. When you are given an image, and you want to downsample it, which you almost always want to do, because when you feed these images, for example, into a deep neural network or a convolutional neural network, those networks are computationally very demanding. And what that means is that these megapixel images that we get even off of our iPhones are just simply too big. And the standard thing that everybody does is they downsample those images by throwing away pixels. But if you don't slightly blur the image prior to that downsampling, you are going to introduce spatial aliasing. And that spatial aliasing is highly unpredictable. It is introducing artifacts in the image that are going to cause problems downstream for any image understanding, any image recognition um, that you're going to do later on. So you have to be very sensitive, not just to the artifacts during the imaging process, chromatic aberrations, noise, all of those things that we've talked about, but also after. JPEG compression, we've already seen. And now, as you manipulate that image, going from high resolution to low resolution, you have to be very careful and very thoughtful how you do these seemingly innocuous manipulations to make sure that you don't introduce artifacts into your imaging pipeline.